Uh, we've done liquid or fluids and fluid statics, fluid dynamics. Now we're gonna, and we said that fluids were liquids and gases. And then we learned some things about incompressible fluids, uh, but incompressible fluids are usually only liquids and a, most compressible fluid, fluids. are gases. And so we're gonna talk about gases and how they operate under different temperatures. And a lot of this will look similar to stuff you've probably seen in chemistry if you've taken chemistry, uh, but there'll be a slightly different physics aspect to things. And so first we're gonna talk about what temperature is. And in this room, it is very low. So for physics, we are going to define temperature as the average kinetic energy of molecules or atoms or particles in whatever thing that we're measuring the temperature of. So if we're measuring the room temperature, then we're measuring the temperature of the gas particles in the room. If we're measuring the temperature of water, we're measuring the, the average kinetic energy of the water molecules and so on. So we don't use units of energy when we're measuring temperature. We have a bunch of other uh, measuring systems. So. And so I'm gonna have my own little diatribe and opinion about temperature systems. So here we go. So since we live in the US, we have Fahrenheit. And the other one that people have probably seen is Celsius. So Fahrenheit, the, and the way that we have defined these two temperature systems is uh, with water at normal atmospheric pressure. So for Fahrenheit, the boiling point of water is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. The freezing point of water is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And then for Celsius, the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. And then the freezing point of water is zero degrees Celsius. So if we did a poll of the people in the room, what, uh, how many, I guess put up one finger for Fahrenheit or two fingers for Celsius as which you think is better.
So some people say one, some people say two. Okay, uh, so I'm in the Fahrenheit camp and I'll explain why. So this is my own little opinion that I'm gonna inject. So for normal human temperatures, Fahrenheit makes more sense. So I guess before, before I say that, so these are both arbitrary measuring systems. So in Fahrenheit, I think the Historically, the goal for this was that the human body temperature was about 100 degrees. And then they were not using very precise measuring tools. So now we know the body temperature for humans is average 98.6 Fahrenheit, uh, but around 100. So that's kind of another uh, point that they used as a basis for establishing this temperature system. And then for Celsius, to establish that temperature system, they just said, we're going to set the boiling point of water to be 100 and the freezing point of water to be zero. And then everything else is relative to those two numbers. So they're both completely arbitrary measuring systems. And they're just based on different things. So. And like I said, this is based on the boiling point of water at one atmosphere of pressure. So if you were on a different planet that still had water and everything, but it had a higher atmospheric pressure, then these numbers wouldn't make any sense. Like these would still be random numbers. They, would, they wouldn't be zero or 100 anymore. So, uh, the fact that we have these is arbitrary. So if we're choosing between two arbitrary systems, then I'm going to pick Fahrenheit because I think that it makes more sense uh, for the temperatures that we encounter on our in our normal lives. So if we look at uh, like weather and Fahrenheit. our temperature scale, like humans, we typically don't live in places where it gets below zero Fahrenheit too often. There are some places where it'll get to negative Fahrenheit and people shouldn't live there. And then we typically only get up to about a hundred degrees Fahrenheit in places uh, that we like to live if you live in the desert in Phoenix, then it gets hotter than that and it sucks. I used to live there, so. Then for, so we have a range here, delta T of about 100. If we do the same thing for Celsius, Uh, let's see, what is 100 degrees? I guess maybe we can do that as part of this example. So if we want to convert between the two, let's see. So Fahrenheit equals Celsius times 9 over 5 plus 32. I think I have that correct. Let's check. And so one, one of the data points you can check is that if, so we know that the freezing point of water is 32 in Fahrenheit and the freezing point of water in Celsius is zero. So that's where we get this plus 32 term from is to make sure that the 
zero point of Celsius is the 32 point of Fahrenheit. And then the other thing we can check is the boiling point of water. So 212 equals C, oops, 100C times nine over five plus 32. So does 100 times nine divided by five plus 32 equal 212 and it does. So if you ever are in a situation where you can't quite remember, but you remember the boiling points and freezing points in both systems, then you can uh, figure out uh, what the conversion factor is by using those data points. Okay, so the zero, so now if we wanna go the other way, Celsius equals Fahrenheit minus 32 divided by nine over five. Or five ninths times F minus 32. So at zero Fahrenheit, you would get negative 32 times five divided by nine. This would be negative 17.8 degrees Celsius. And then 100 Fahrenheit. So 100 minus 32 times five divided by nine. This would be about 37.8 Celsius. So we take these two things and subtract them. And so now we've got a temperatures difference of 55.6. So if you were developing a thermometer to measure between these two temperature scales, you now have 100 tick marks in the Fahrenheit and you only have 50 tick marks in the Celsius. So if you want to measure more precisely, it's easier to do it with Fahrenheit than it is with Celsius. And then that's not also not getting into the fact that when we're using Celsius, we're gonna enter into the negative domain a lot earlier than we would if we're looking at the Fahrenheit scale. So again, there's not really a right or wrong answer here. Uh, I just, and maybe just cause I'm a contrarian, but I, I don't think Celsius is necessarily inherently super better than Fahrenheit but they're both completely arbitrary. So they're both not what we're gonna to use to do science anyways. So we have a third temperature scale and that third temperature scale is gonna be in Kelvin. And the way that Kelvin is different is that the zero point is defined as absolute zero. And so that's the point where the kinetic energies of the particles go to zero. So if there's no kinetic energy, that just means that the particles stop moving. And so where the zero point in Fahrenheit didn't really mean anything 
and the zero point in Celsius meant the freezing point of water at one atmosphere of pressure. Kelvin zero point is an actual physical meaning for when the particles that you're trying to measure stop having any velocity. And so then the temperature scale for Kelvin starts at zero. You can't have negative Kelvin temperatures. And then it goes up from there. Uh, and then a couple things to note. So when we write Fahrenheit or Celsius, these have degrees. But when we write Kelvin, there's no degree symbol. And then the scale for Kelvin. is the same as Celsius. So a change in temperature of one Celsius is the same as the change in temperature of one Kelvin. And so the scale is just the, like if you were reading a thermometer, then the tick marks, the separation between the tick marks would be the same for a, a degree Celsius as they would be for Kelvin. So for all of the rest of the stuff that we talk about temperature, we're going to be talking about Kelvin. So then we will start discussing some effects of temperatures. So this will be thermal expansion. And contraction. So if you increase the temperature of something, you can increase its length or its volume, or if you decrease the temperature of something, you can decrease its size. So in equation form, that looks like this. So there'll be two different cases. So there'll be a one dimensional case, and then a three dimensional case. So for length, the change in length is going to be equal to some expansion factor alpha, then the initial length, and then the change in temperature. Change in length. This is an expansion factor. This is the initial length. And this is the change in temperature. So this expansion factor is just a property of whatever material. So if you had some type of metal, then that would have one expansion factor. If you have water, that would be some other expansion factor. And so this is going to be for um, solids and liquids. And then in a moment, we'll see uh, what this is for gases. 
now in three dimensions. The, we're no longer looking at a change in length, we're looking at a change in volume. And that's gonna be equal to some different expansion factor beta times the initial volume times the change in temperature. So it looks similar. And then this new expansion factor beta is approximately equal to three alpha. So if you know what the linear expansion factor is, then you can just multiply that by three to get the three-dimensional expansion factor. Yeah, so it, like in the homework problems, there's a, a table in the textbook that has a bunch of different materials and their expansion factors. Or yeah, on a, an exam or something, you would be given the that term. And I mean, conceptually, the, the takeaway here is that the the change in length is proportional to the, the change in temperature or the change in volume is proportional to the change in temperature. So if you increase the temperature, then you would increase the length. Or if you decrease the temperature, you would decrease the length or the volume. 